we are entering into uh, the last week before we celebrate what we call resurrection or Easter, depending on what term you like to use. And so we're going to talk about that from a different point of view, but biblically. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for what you're doing in our lives. I ask that you be with Pastor Bill and just thank you for what you're doing in his life and re-refreshing him physically, Lord, as he's still uh, recuperating from the situations he had a week or two ago. And we just thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness over that family and continue for him and his wife and all that comes with that. We also thank you for Pastor Rick and his wife as they're also dealing with a situation that put him in the hospital. We just thank you, Lord, the faithfulness that you are to all of us and especially to our leaders, Lord, that we see before us. We thank you for that and all those others, Lord, that are suffering from sickness. We believe and we thank you for your healing power in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a verse in scripture, and I will have my wife read the whole thing here in a bit, that says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's very true, and it comes with embracing not just being saved, but all that that comes with being saved that the Bible talks about, that you get to embrace the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ascension and the work of the Holy Spirit. All that comes with the whole significance of believing on Jesus Christ. This month, especially in March, around the world, especially in America, we began to see the commercials and we began to understand that they're just celebrating that a large amount of the population of the United States and a big piece of around the world begins to embrace Easter or the resurrection. Whether they believe in it or not, they embrace it through the various family fun things that we do, uh, from the various spiritual, re, uh, religious uh, festivals that we do. All that is an embracing of what Jesus did by dying on the cross. But you can embrace or accept those things without really involving yourself in a heart spirit felt relationship to that connection. That you can have fun, even acknowledge or reject the reality of the spiritual situation of that and still be okay. I mean, you still are embracing that this person, this human being that went by the name of Jesus Christ that the world is now celebrating. And this is at least a couple thousand years ago that this happened. And we're still embracing that one day out of a year, every year. That's really kind of really unique. And it sees the impact of that person and his life had on the world. Whether you embrace it in faith or just embrace it in the act of what happened that others are affected by. The Bible is clear on how and purposely that was, that Jesus did that. There was a time in the Gospels where Jesus is sharing that with his closest disciples. And one specific person named Peter rejects, even though he accepted that Jesus must be connected to the Son of God. He has a revelation, an understanding of that. And then as Jesus is talking about having to die, Peter says, no, that can't happen. 
And Jesus explained it is a must and it has to happen. And matter of fact, woe that you even considered that it can't happen. It is the very core significance of what Jesus Christ did and the reason he came. Now, it's more than just him dying. He came also as a human being because he was 100% human, born like us, breathed, did all the things that we do as human beings, but he's also 100% God. <laughs> so he's both. But as him being a human, the only times that you see the demonstration of him being God is when he's helping or healing other people because he prays and uh, casts out demons and does the various different things that he's doing in the response of him being God, but he's not doing his daily routines. He's still eating, doing all the things everybody else doing, and he's not stepping in to he's the creator, that he is the one that put all these together. He's still subject, just like me and you, to every day rest, all those things that they needed then, walking, all the tiredness, all of that, because it talks how there's times he was tired and he needed to rest that he still was subject to all that, and he did not. Even when Satan tried to tempt him and says, you know, you're fasting for 40 days, you got to be hungry. Why don't you prove to me that I am your God by turning rocks into bread? And Jesus said, no, I'm not going there. <laughs> he could have done that, but he would have stepped out of his humanity and operated as a human into the reality of God for his own benefit, and he didn't do that. He only did that for others, where it was necessary to heal and touch others' life that he stepped into his divinity and, and allowed a miracle to happen. So as you believe in the act of him going up on the cross, you also, whether you are aware or not, and God wants us really to be aware of it, that you're embracing all of that in knowing that he is Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And yet he's also a person that's coming from the Trinity and is living here on earth as God, but acting as a human. Now, on that day, as he's going to the cross and he's being purposely abused and personally being challenged by people who claimed to be believers in God, who are claiming to be children of the Jewish people and of Abraham, are some of the very people who are wanting to crucify him. Now, that's not all of them. There was a segment of people in that group that wanted to do that to where they even condemned, convinced a person who really had no desire to embrace Jewish culture other than necessary to help him rule the Jewish people, which is Pilate, is forced to even bow down to their wishes and going ahead and getting Jesus uh, whipped and allowing him to be crucified. It is in that moment that he goes to the cross that he is in the middle of a number of other people who are also being crucified and there's two pacific people that it talks about one on the right and one on the left that it says in the beginning everyone that was going to be crucified with him was mocking him and ruled killing him too it wasn't just the people who were standing out. There was some of the people who were going to die along with him. And in this conversation, one of them says to the other, why are we doing this? And he specifically looks over to the other person and says, why are we doing this? When we know this is an honest man, he's not here because we are here, because we've done wrong, and we know we've done wrong, and now we've got to pay it. 
What has he done? And yet he's here. So why are you rallying? And then he asks Jesus to remember him when he goes to paradise. And that happens. It is in those things that we are beginning to have a understanding for and believing for. Now I'm going to stop for a moment and ask my wife to go ahead and read uh, the few scriptures. Romans 10, 8 to 13. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now we put that whole content into the way the Bible says it. And then we see a much more stronger understanding of what it is to call on the name of the Lord. In any event, I do believe that when people call on him, God is going to save them. I also come to understand that God had already decided that it would be a need for him to die because he was willing to give man a choice to decide whether he wanted to be obedient in his relationship and follow him or he chose not to. And because he already understood that man would choose, mankind, not just man, would choose not to, it says in Revelations that he was slayed from the foundation of the earth before it. So there's an understanding in God's mind that I need to do this, and he's already established that he would share, shed his life for us. And it's later in our human relationship and understanding that that act actually happens. But he writ it down in history. So when you read, I believe, Psalms 22, that whole Psalms is about that very day. And it talks about him being whipped. It talked about how his body yielded and was moved by the whole force of the cross being dropped in a hole. His whole body twists and shakes. And how the soldiers are even gambling over his Clothing, all that's shared by some think it was David or some are not sure, but whoever God inspired to write that specific Psalms, which is long time before it happens, is prophetically speaking forth a situation that God had already said and said would happen and looking down. Now, I don't believe that that's saying that God actually calls those people to do those things as it is God seen them doing those things and he writes it down. So I, sometimes people say, well, God didn't cause them people to do all that. Well, I don't know, but he definitely seen it and he wrote it down for us. And we see in scripture how all that is a fulfillment of this purpose driven God's passion and desire to shed himself for us. And we even see that as he's testing Abraham and his devotion and trusting him, and he asked Abraham to put his son on the altar, we also see right then is another prophetic or another way of God showing us his heart for us and understanding what he's asked Abraham to do, knowing that he is going to actually do that and that there won't be any other provision like it is for Abraham, that that real reality will be God giving up his son for us and that his son is accepting that 
purpose in dying willingly, even though we see in the garden how he's in anguish with his humanity and he's wanting not to go through this. He understands what's fitting to happen. He understands how he was literally going to stand alone, that those who stood with him and, and by all means really wanted to stand with him, you know, really meant what they said. Peter, I believe, really meant and thought that he could stand with Jesus, but God knew he couldn't in, in, in reality. But he knows this and he's there praying and he in such a purpose of making this happen that he begins to drop blood or sweat as though it's really looking like blood and it drops out of his body as he's in a great torment here of praying and asking God's will to be done and allowing him to go through what he now is fitting to suffer as a human being. So it isn't that even in that that he's stepping into his godhood and said, I don't feel the pain. I'm not going to feel the emotional withdrawal. He's embracing all of that for us. So he understands as humans what we go through, that he's making it. So I find comfort when I face real difficulties, and we all face difficulties, knowing that I'm talking to someone that can relate, excuse me, relate literally by experience of my pain because he's already been there as a human. He's already understood rejection, all the things that I may be facing in my situation right at the moment that he understands. And yet he's here for me and to take all that weight off if I trust him. Now, it doesn't change the situation necessarily. Sometimes God does change the situation. But more than anything, he brings a peace that comes with me believing and being saved. It brings a peace if I'm willing to embrace that peace. Now, I can reject that peace. I can be caught up in the fear, all the reality that's around me. There was a time that God uh, was walking on water. Peter says, can I join? God says, come on. He steps out there. And he had faith, but all of a sudden he looks at the natural reality and begins to doubt because he's thinking, how can I be doing this? God tells us that once we start having faith, we have to go beyond the realities that surround us. We cannot allow our faith to Weaver, even though supernatural or the reality of what could not be possible is now being possible, all because I believe. All because I'm having faith in the one that died for me, in the one that came and suffered for me. Now, in the middle of all of that, stay focused. Stay focused that he's faithful and enjoy the faithfulness of God and not allow yourself to be caught off by the reality that you're facing in trust. Now, it doesn't take away that that reality is real. <laughs> and there's no getting around it when your body hurts and, and you're facing death. But my peace is coming that the fact that I trust and believe in the faithfulness of the one who died for me. Now, another part of embracing is... God showed when he was here on earth that he had power over death. There's at least three specific examples in the Gospels that talk about God raising people from the dead. There's a boy, there's a girl, and there's laughter. Now, there's many, you know, a few more, but those specific ones. So he's already showed that he has power over death. So it wasn't the first time that he's going to show that power. But he says in a statement that I want Phyllis to go ahead and read. Yeah, it was 16, 17. Yeah. Uh, Jesus said, I John 16, 7 through 8. will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. 
When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness with, and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Now he said those things before he actually winded up being on the cross. So he's already acknowledging to us that he's purposely laying down his life, that he is embracing this even as a human, even though he's going to have to really draw from the power of God as a human to get through these pains and this difference that I already explained in the garden. But he's doing it willingly. He's doing it for us. Because he loves us and he wants to bring us back in the fullness that his father and himself and the Holy Spirit did from the beginning is create us for communion and for relationship. And he wants to renew that. But he's going to fully renew that in the spirit of who we are as spirit human beings. And the Bible later says, Jesus says, that your spirit must be born again. So now that I'm embracing the cross, I'm also getting ready at some point. I may not do it right at the moment, but at some point I'm going to embrace the work of the comforter because God is going to send someone that he calls the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, back to us. He talks to Nicodemus about being born again, our spirit, that brings us into the kingdom. All of that is entitled to those who believe. Now, that usually happens with a process. Some, it happens instantly. But either way, it will come to pass because he spoke it. Now, one unique great thing about this is now we're embracing his death. We now embrace the fact that he comes back alive. He comes back alive as God and as a human because he's able to eat. He's able to walk around just like he did before. And he's also doing something that he did not do before. Not that he couldn't, but he didn't. He walks through a room. So it's not like he's just ghosts. He's actually a solid being and he walks through a wall because then suddenly say they're in this room and all of a sudden Jesus is there so however he showed up he's there and one says that there are unbeliever Thomas come here now he just walked and appeared take your finger and touch me well he doesn't take his finger and go through Jesus and tell oh my hand he feels something so just amazing there it is this form is still there and he's able to fill the holes and fill the scars because he is now glorified. He is now changed. And it gives us an example. I don't know how we're going to look in heaven. I have no really, well, there's some clues in the Bible, but I have no real honest conception of what that means. But we will have a body, and it says later in Scripture that we'll be uh, born, in, uh, be incorruptible and come corru uh, different. We're coming from sin and coming into the holiness of God. So when we are transferred into heaven, we'll have a spirit body that's redeemed. So we get a chance to maybe see what that might look like in what Jesus now is showing. Now, um, you know, it gives us an example that we're not just ghosts floating around, that we're actually a, a being that has some kind of form, what that looks like. But the cool thing to look at here is also one very very important thing. Jesus says in that statement that I have to go back to heaven because if I don't go back, then the comforter won't come. So that's connected. So as Jesus leaves and they watch him go up, he is now going back to the throne of heaven where he is literally, he's omnificent, so he's able to do this at the same time, but he's sitting, the Bible says, at the right hand, making intercessory in prayer for all us believers. Isn't that really cool? Now, 
You can just accept, and I'm not saying that's wrong. I think it's great to just accept the fact that I'm saved. That's a good thing, and you need to go there, especially if you're saved. But if you allow yourself to embrace the whole thing as God reveals those truths to you, you now understand that you're in a kingdom. And you understand the meaning where Jesus says, I am not of this world. So we're not, even though we're in this world, our existence right now as believers is from another dimension. And it's in our spirit. So start thinking is what this verse is telling you from that perception and that reality and not just from the reality of earth. Both, you got to do both because you're still here. So you can't not just forget that you're here. But also realize that you are able to be able to be a part of this domain that is called heaven and is here right now. And because of the Holy Spirit that's now operating through you by faith, you can actually change things just like Jesus did. You can actually walk in that realm and by faith change situations, especially when you hear from God to tell you to do that. There are times when you just know in your spirit that God is wanting you to act in a way that allows his spirit to perform miracles. I think that is so wonderful. And that comes with believing in what Jesus did. And it does bother me. I, I, I'm trying not to say that, but I have to say that. It does bother me that a lot of people only stop at celebrating that Jesus was a person. And even though some celebrate that Jesus was a God and a person. But there's a lot, and that's what I mean by bothering me, and it bothers me is like they're missing out kind of bothering. Not that it affects me in a way that I'm upset with them or nothing, but it bothers me that, and even I did that for a while, it bothers me that they don't get the whole benefits of what God really has for us. And it's important that I have to come through the door of salvation. I have to embrace the cross. I have to embrace his dying for me. I have to embrace his dissension. All that allows me now to be a full-fledged son or daughter of God while I'm alive and I can walk in the realms of heaven right now as God allows me in my everyday world and make a difference. I want to be able to share that when God allows me so others may not see that right now, can embrace that and see all that we can be because it's our destiny. It comes with the whole thing of believing in Christ. And I want to hopefully inspire that. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of sharing and the opportunity of being a part of this congregation. In Jesus' name, amen.